Hello, and thanks for joining us. Today, we will be presenting on how to manipulate geospatial data at massive scale. My name is Chris Hicks, and I'm a staff software engineer at John Deere. I've been with John Deere for almost two years working in our data science and engineering space. And I'm Charcy Peterson. I'm also an engineer at Deere. I haven't been on the team as long, just a few months, but I'm also working in the data engineering space. Today, we will start with an introduction to data science and engineering at Deere. Next, Charcy will talk about how we partition our data sets by space to maximize geospatial performance. And thirdly, I will talk about an application of that partitioning in our scalable point and polygon algorithm for Spark. Charcy and I are a part of the data, and, and data science and engineering uh, department at Deere. Our mission is to leverage data and analytics to enable smarter equipment and better decisions. An example of how we do this is shown on this slide. John Deere equipment emits high resolution IoT sensor data, such as planting data in the picture on the left. You can see each yellow dot represents one unit of planting data that was collected during the operation. We collect this IoT sensor data and use it along with various layers of environmental geospatial data in our analytics engine, which is, allows our data scientists to drive the next generation of insights for our customers. Thanks, Chris. So I'm gonna talk about partitioning by space. So when we have these big data sets, it's very important that we pick partitions and just as a refresher, a partition is just um, an identifier that segments your data set. It's very important to pick a partition that's going to be useful and really represent the data so that you can perform performant queries and um, repeatable query times and job times. So when you're picking a partition, critical to know your data set, but some common types of partitions would be by time. So maybe you partition by year or month, different static types that are common for your specific data set. In the instance of agricultural data, that could be something like a harvest or application or seeding. And then the one that we're gonna focus on is by geographical space. And with partitions, you wanna strive for the data within a given partition to be the same size. And that's gonna look like the graph I have here. So in the graphs that I'm gonna go through in these slides, there's only 10 partitions. Um, you would likely have a lot more in your specific data set. But the point here is just to show the distribution of data within each partition. The reason that you want it to be even is to minimize skew, which allows you to have repeatable and predictable job or query runs. So let's talk about how you can partition by space. There's a few different algorithms available, um, but the one that we went with, and the one we're gonna talk about today is called uh, a quad tree. And so let's talk through the, the photo I have here. So quad tree, as you can probably get from the title, is just a tree with four children. So at level one of the tree, we project the earth to be flat, and then we split it up into four quadrants. Now, each of those quadrants splits into its four children, which then itself splits into four children, and so on and so forth. So as you get to higher and higher resolutions, the amount of geographic space within the quad key gets smaller and smaller. And that means it's really good for projecting 2D data into a single data point. So you decide you wanna partition your data set by space. You choose your quad key uh, resolution. So say you choose like level six, for example, you break up the world into level six, you put your data into those uh, different keys, effectively being partitions. You look at your partitions and they're extremely skewed. Well, that is not too good. So you look and you see most of my data is in two partitions or a few partitions. Some partitions have no data at all. What is going on here? Well, turns out that not all data is distributed evenly, especially spatial data. So there's different characteristics of data that's gonna affect where it is in the world. Think of farmland, that's concentrated to certain areas. Think of cities, think of transportation networks. All of those, if you put data in them, is not gonna be evenly distributed across space over the world. So 
in this picture, you can see what we did is we split our data set into just one single resolution. So all of the keys are all of those squares are the same geographic size. But then within that, we had varying levels of data. So some we might have like no data, other ones we might have a ton of data, billions of records. So we got really skewed and that is not what we want. So next we'll talk about what we did to fix that. We decided to create a custom quad tree. So if you wanna go about this approach, what you would do is you would choose your min and your max quad key resolutions. And you would also choose what's called a breakpoint density. And that is the number of records per quad key before you would skip down to the next resolution. So if we look at these pictures here, what's going on is you start at your min resolution, or your, sorry, yes, your min resolution. So say you start at six, level six, and you're going through and you're looking at all the data that goes into that specific key. And say you hit your breakpoint density of a million records. So that key is gonna get split into its four children. And then you're gonna look through each of those and you're gonna keep splitting as you hit that breakpoint density. When you haven't hit that breakpoint density, you move on to the next one. And then uh, at the end, if you wanna visualize it, this is what it might look like. So those high density areas that we saw are gonna have high resolution quad keys that go along with them. So instead of balancing by geographic space, you also balance by data density. And if you were to graph the partitions, hopefully they look something like this. So most of your data is going to be spread out on most of the partitions. Now it's likely you're still gonna have one, two, maybe 20 partitions that don't have a lot of data. Just because of the nature of data, maybe you have one data point that's on an island or something like that. That can definitely happen, but by and large, hopefully you have um, a pretty level number of data in each partition. If you do this and your data is still heavily skewed, you could consider decreasing the lowest level of quad key uh, resolution or increasing the density breakpoint. And this is kind of what it comes back to knowing your data set, knowing how it's spatially distributed and things like that. And so you can play around with it until you kind of figure out where those partitions should land. And this can also be something that you come back to over time. So you're gonna have to repartition your database over time as Maybe you get a new customer, you have a lot of data in an area you didn't have before. So it's good to be able to build this custom tree because then you can reapply it to your data set over time. Um, do be mindful of the total number of partitions that you have. Uh, don't, you don't want too few, but you also don't want too many, but uh, your Databricks consultant can be super helpful with that for figuring out what's gonna be right for your data set. And then lastly, you could consider multiple partitions. So maybe you do partition by space, but you're just not getting the performance that you need, you could consider another partition, maybe by time, maybe by, like I said, those static types by harvest, for example. But do remember that order matters. So what do you wanna partition by first and second and third? So keep that in mind. And then here, I just wanted to show how easy it is to apply with Spark and Delta Lake. So in this code snippet, just saving a data frame as a partition Delta Lake table, so you simply enter the format uh, as delta and then partition by is going to be what column name you have assigned to that partition. In this case, it would be quad key. So that's what we did to partition our database or our data set by space. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Chris and he's going to talk about one of the cool queries we wrote. Thanks, Jersey. Um, now that we've uh, learned how to partition our data sets by space, I'm going to talk about an application of this partitioning in our scalable point and polygon algorithm. So the problem we faced uh, was our data scientists at DEER need to efficiently query geospatial boundaries using PySpark. This is central to a lot of the insights we generate for our farmers. The algorithm we'll focus on today, uh, ray casting is a very popular algorithm for point and polygon searches. This algorithm states that from a given point, if you cast a ray in any direction, that point is within a polygon if it intersects an odd number of times. You can see this on the left with the simple rectangle example. The point in the middle of the rectangle casts a ray and intersects once on the edges. 
while the point below the rectangle intersects twice. This algorithm also extends to complex multi-polygons, like the picture in the middle, the shape of Italy, for instance. One challenge we had with this algorithm is the overall brute force time complexity. The approximate time complexity is shown on this slide. It's approximately big O of the number of points or rows in your database times the number of edges in the polygon. So this is not easily scalable for polygons with thousands of edges, um, like Italy, for instance, has over 3000 edges in this example or large Spark data frames with billions to trillions of rows, um, like many of the data frames we use in our work at DEER. Another problem we faced was finding a good open source solution that was sufficient for all of our needs. In particular, we struggled to find something um, that was efficient and would natively take full advantage of our quad tree partitioning structure. So our solution to these problems were to write our own point and polygon algorithm, which maximized the use of our quad tree partitioning structure and expands the use of quad trees to minimize the computation needed. To demonstrate the power of this implementation, here's a hypothetical example, which is similar to the types of data sets we work with. In this example, we have a table consisting of exactly 1 trillion rows. This is a Delta Lake table with 5,000 quad tree partitions we are assuming that there is zero skew in the data. It is perfectly partitioned across the table in these 5,000 quad tree keys. So each partition will have um, 2 billion rows. So the problem we're trying to solve is we want to find all of the points within the shape of Italy. And the shape of Italy has over 3,000 edges. If we look at the Bruce brute force runtime, we would need to run the ray casting algorithm for all 1 trillion rows and 3,000 edges which would result in approximately three quadrillion point and polygon calculations. So from this brute force approach, uh, we will attempt to improve this computation in three separate steps. First on the left, we're going to use the existing quad tree partitions that we already have in our table to immediately filter to only the quad keys we care about. Second, uh, the, and in the picture in the middle, um, we will construct a quad tree within the bounds of the polygon to capture most of the points within the polygon. Finally, for any points which may lie either inside or outside the polygon but reside along the edges, we're going to perform a much smaller scale ray casting algorithm. So in step one, um, the first thing we want to do, because we have these uh, quad tree partitions in our table already, we can use these immediately to filter out uh, the data to only the quad keys that we care about. For this example, we have nine partitions in and around the shape of Italy. So we're immediately able to reduce our data frame um, from 1 trillion rows to 18 million rows, or just under 2% of the original table. And thanks to Delta Lake, we can do this in constant time using partition pruning. A simple metadata lookup is involved with partition pruning and the time to look up that metadata is constant no matter how large our table might grow. Now that we've reduced the table from 1 trillion to 18 billion rows, our next step is to identify most of the points within the polygon by constructing a full quad tree within the boundaries of the polygon. So from the polygon geometry that we input, we construct a quad tree, which is fully contained within these boundaries. We take the keys from each node in the tree and put it into a large set. Then for each of these 18 billion rows, we do a latitude longitude to quad tree key conversion at a very high resolution. So from here, we are able to check each of the 18 billion rows um, whether or not they belong to that larger quad key set that we constructed from the boundary. When we do this for our provided example, we find that 15 billion points are indeed contained in the quad tree. But the question remains, what about the other 3 billion? Now that we've identified most of the points within the polygon, we still need to determine whether the 3 billion remaining rows along the edges are either inside or outside of the polygon. To do this, we need to use 
the ray casting algorithm, um, but we're able to use it at a much smaller scale than before. So to do this, we break down the edges of the polygon into, in this example, a thousand high resolution tiles. Um, since our polygon is about 3000 edges in total, each tile is going to contain approximately three edges. So from here, we can do the full ray casting algorithm on a reduced number of rows, the 3 billion rows remaining, as well as these 1000 small tiles with three edges each. So if we go back and think about our total time complexity for the ray casting algorithm, um, which is a big O of the number of points times the number of edges, the number of points has been reduced from 1 trillion to 3 billion. The number of edges has been reduced from 3000 to an average on of three on each tile. So we end up with only about 9 billion point in polygon calculations, which is several orders of magnitude smaller than our brute force solution. Now that we understand our optimized algorithm, let's look at how we'll translate this to the Catalyst Optimizer for use in Spark SQL. First, we define a case class that extends rule of logical plan. And this is the first line in the code. Um, in this allows us to build a rule that can be injected into Spark's tree-based logical plan. Then um, in the second line, uh, we define a case class, uh, excuse me, we apply a partial function to the catalyst transform all expressions method in which we apply pattern matching for our function name. And so here, our function name is point and polygon. So you can see the case point and polygon statement um, in the pattern matching that, that occurs through that case statement. From there, within our case statement, we just apply our three-step project process. Each step is going to have its own catalyst expression. Um, so step one, you can see we filter by our partitions and the in partitions uh, variable is our resulting expression for step one. For step two, we construct a quad tree to find most of the points contained in the polygon. So the contained in quad tree variable is our resulting expression for step two. For step three, we find all of the points along the edge of the polygon and we use uh, the ray casting algorithm on the edge tiles. So the ray cast success variable is our resulting expression for step three. So finally, we take our three resulting expressions and create one high level catalyst expression, which states the point is in the polygon if it's in partitions and either it's contained in quad tree or raycast success. To learn more about the internals of the Spark Catalyst Optimizer, Linked at the bottom of the slide is a very insightful deep dive document from Databricks. So now I'll pass it back to Charcy to, to discuss the outcomes of these algorithms and implementations. Thanks, Chris. So two main outcomes here we want to highlight. The one is simply time. So we can query petabytes of data in seconds to minutes. And this is extremely important for any processes that we have running. Um, for anyone that wants to consume our data, it's great that they could get it within seconds to minutes instead of any brute force uh, back end that's going to take hours to possibly complete. And kind of to build off of that, now we're enabling the generation of features for machine learning because we can serve up this data in a predictable way um, and in a fast way that allows us to build features um, that can enhance. John Deere's data science. So that's why, you know, Chris was saying we have a data science and engineering department. So we're really going hand in hand to enable that data science with the data engineering that we're doing. Finally, we'd like to thank you all for joining us for this presentation. We hope you enjoy it and uh, please leave your feedback.